Hey there, folks. Welcome to Spectrum Pulse. We talk about music, movies, art, and culture. And this week feels kind of odd to me. A surprise release that I already covered pretty much overshadows an already busy week. So while I still wound up with a lot to say, because it's me, I'm under no illusions that the collection that I cover here will attract all the same attention, but that doesn't mean I won't try for it. So what the hell? This is On The Pulse. So we've got eight albums on the docket, but let's first start with from Taylor Swift, Folklore. Caught again under someone's bed. You put me on and said I was your favorite. I already talked about this one for longer than I personally expected I would in a solo review, but to go through this pretty briefly, really damn good, features some of her best songs to date, but can feel kind of scattered in its themes, languid in its pacing, over long, a little derivative in its production style if you know indie music, and ultimately a tougher album to revisit than her more inconsistent but hook-ready albums. I am convinced this is going to wind up sticking with me courtesy of the best songs, and you know what, if she can push this specific tone of indie music more into the mainstream, hell yeah, I'm on board, this could be something special. So strong 7 out of 10, and somehow, if you haven't heard it, worth a couple listens. Let's make this a thing. Next up from Blue and Exile, Miles. Miles Davis. I've talked a decent amount about Blue on my channel, considering how much work he puts out. I'm generally accepting of how I'm not gonna get to everything, that just happens. But one album that tends to hang above a lot of his catalog is 2007's Below the Heavens with Exile, widely considered one of the best rap albums of the 2000s, and one of those debuts I can tell Blue has long stopped trying to chase, especially after his delayed follow-up with Exile in 2012 did not quite stick the landing. But you know what, after compiling a bunch of their material, and touring last year and dropping an EP, a return collaboration was plainly on the horizon, and thus with it now here... Well, it's a little strange that a project so sprawling can feel so oddly thin, where I found myself relishing the touches of vintage hip-hop and jazz and soul and African music that sampled and blended really well by Exile, and his verses scattered across this project are really damn solid, as are those from Choosy and Ace Alone. And you know what? Most of the hooks are really damn good good too, courtesy of Miguel and Ish and C.S. Armstrong and even Fashion. I mean, I might have personally preferred a verse from him, but you know what? He was fine. And yet, for clocking over an hour and a half, it's more than a little bit frustrating that Blue himself might be the most underwhelming part of this entire project. Yeah, there are moments where the outros of the songs are going to run long, but I kind of prefer those to when Blue would just drop into an extended list of names where connections to any central theme, even within the song, can start to feel a little tenuous. And that's not helped by Blue casually dropping the rhyme scheme or rhyming words themselves that might start off as charmingly slapdash, but can start to come compromise the flow the further you get in, and this album relies on flow. More to the point, as much as there might seem to be an arc of Blue's life, from where he began in music to becoming an underground rapper and chasing success, and then finding some greater aspirational stage of enlightenment to bring it all back full circle, as much as I might admire the great kickback moments where the bars will flow freely with a lot of optimism, I'd like to hope they would amount to a slightly heavier theme that really just does not coalesce the deep you get in here. Even the aspirational focus starts to feel a little bit more like wishful thinking and pipe dreams. And considering how often he will challenge your dreams, I'm a little surprised he doesn't examine some of his own moments on songs like Dear Lord. Now, again, there are great individual moments. You Ain't Never Been Blue is a great downer song that restores some much-needed reality, and I like the interweaving parallel with Miles Davis's life on All the Blues, but I can't be the only one who thinks it's kind of jarring in the extreme to conclude the project with the end. A hard swerve into more violent and hyperbolic subject matter that kind of shatters the larger atmosphere and isn't really foreshadowed, especially as the darker moments were nearly a dozen songs earlier on the album. More often, I'm reminded of a project that just kind of loses track of its own ideas and can feel like it's looking to fill time to pad out the runtime, make those miles really linger for the audience, and that can be a bit of a mixed blessing here. Which 
which is frustrating because as a whole, I really do like a lot of the vibe. This is an album that I feel is one really good edit away from being excellent. But as it is, strong 7 out of 10, very good, more than a few standouts, a little tougher to recommend as a whole. That's all. Next up from Neck Deep, all distortions are intentional. This is the sort of band that is built for On The Pulse, a relatively solid pop punk act that wins me over if the writing or hooks punch above the weight class, but for the most part can be summarized by, well, if you like this sound, you've heard it hundreds of times before, you'll probably like this. Now granted, 1970-something wound up as a deceptively killer pop punk ballad and one of my favorite songs of 2017, so I was really open to this being great, but I'm not surprised that it wound up being pretty forgettable at best. I mean, can I even give them that much credit for polishing up the production when they still shove in a lot of unnecessary drum machines and seem to forget what a bass frequency even is across the album? Pop Punk can be kind of hit and miss in this department as it is, but way to leech out so many of your songs of their greatest impact in the low end. Not helped by a particularly snotty Ben Barlow who only sounds thinner on this album. And keep in mind that neck deep, they're still writing some painfully wrote pop punk melodies that you've undoubtedly heard countless times over the past two decades, which means it might kind of blow your mind when I tell you that this was apparently written as a concept album with an actual narrative from song to song. You'd be forgiven for not noticing that at all because said story is a very basic love in time of vague dystopia and incidentally their bouncy major key pop punk cannot create this mood whatsoever and the songs really are painfully basic and sketching out any sort of disaffected love story. They're pretty much interchangeable with anything you've heard in this vein before, and it's just extremely thin. And when Neck Deep decides to end the album with a, well, we figured out the formula, we're all gonna die anyway, screw your politics and everything else, I'm inclined to take the word punk away from this group until they actually realize what it used to mean. Empty, formless nihilism to think you are above the politics is the definition of privilege privilege boys and this band is not interesting enough to earn that particular escape hatch so yeah light five out of ten more flatly competent than outright bad but you will forget this exists by the end of 2020 just saying next up from courtney marie andrews old flowers oh, it must be someone else's fault Oh, I was worried about this one. I remember catching Honest Life in late 2016 and finding a few brilliant choice songs and then having my mind blown when in 2018 she expanded the lush richness of her production on May Your Kindness Remain that fit with her huge expansive voice that always seemed to infuse seemingly simple songs with so much more depth. Now that album wound up as one of my favorites of that year and deservingly so, but I also knew exactly how delicate that alchemy was and potentially stripping back the production to a more minimalist arrangement might expose how her writing and compositions weren't quite as distinct or ahead of the field, and I think that wound up as kind of half true here. Yes, Old Flowers is a step back across the board on production. The tones are more spare, the mix does not have the same richness or warmth, especially in the low end. Even Courtney Marie Andrews' vocal pickups, they sound kind of clunkier and not nearly as well blended, going for more of a live mix, which is about the last thing you want. And that's not even counting in the multi-tracking, which she doesn't need. And why would you diminish your central star's biggest strengths? More than that, usually when we get percussion at all, there are these clunky, somewhat unstable snare drums that echo and seem a lot louder in the mix. They kind of remind me of similar attempts at instability that I've heard before from acts like Sharon Van Etten or Fiona Apple as of recently. But Courtney Marie Andrews' delivery, she's too liquid and full to bounce off them all that well. And all that's a goddamn shame because across the board, the songwriting, it's flat out excellent. A lot of the old flowers she's referring to are the remnants of past relationships, good or ill. 
real, or imagined. And as such, it's the perfect subject matter for how well she can convey so much detail just on delivery alone. And the emotional nuance that she rings out of so many unspoken moments, it's genuinely impressive. She's that good of a performer, especially when the barriers of time or other relationships will mean that true love isn't likely meant to happen. Like on Guilty or How You Get Hurt, my two major standouts on this project. Although I will say Together or Alone probably also fits the bill. And hell, when the mix does fill out a little bit more, like on It Must Be Someone Else's Fault, it's a great slice of willful denial that was a real bright spot on a record that can otherwise feel very slow and very heavy. In other words, you know, I am convinced that these songs could well be great with a different arrangement, or even just production that didn't feel so barren and clunky, which is why I'm giving it a very solid 7 out of 10, and instead of a recommendation, a desperate plea to the universe or production team somehow, or even her, somehow the album gets re-recorded, or at some points we get new versions of these tracks. Because this is really good, it should have been amazing, and I want to hear the versions of these songs where they actually are. Because I think that's possible. Next up, from the Naked and Famous, Recover. Another, but I can regain myself and recover. Now getting to some indie pop here... I'll be honest, did anybody really care all that much about The Naked and Famous? I've heard about this band in passing on a smattering of singles and soundtracked a couple of commercials, especially off a reasonably well-received debut album, but they never really stuck out much in the field in a slurry of buzzed-out mixes, flat percussion, and increasingly underwhelming songwriting. Not helped by a bizarre singer-songwriter attempt in 2018 that I don't think anybody liked, including even their fans. It kind of highlighted a lot of their greatest weaknesses. But hey, they were looking for a slightly more expansive indie pop project here that was calling a little bit back more to that debut, and well, I'm a bit conflicted, because while this is probably the most energetic and interesting thing that the Naked and Famous have done in some time, the more listens I gave this album, the more I was just convinced they did so by picking up the textures and sounds of other acts for their particular dilution of the current pop rock formula. There's a lot of the 1975 here, a smattering of churches as well, as well as so many of the recent subset of 80s inspired indie pop updated with blocky but faded effects to go a little more in the synthwave direction, but rarely able to capture that sense of bigness or supercharged groove that made the best of the new wave of that era. And the Naked and Famous, they're among some of the most blocky and overproduced of that pack. And all that would be fine if they had the hooks or the writing to really stick out and back it up, but very quickly you realize the songs are pretty basic love and breakup songs with a few scattered musings on death and depression that you've all heard before, with one kind of cute song inspired by the front woman's dog. But I think my larger issue is that once you realize the only trick they really have when writing a hook is to stack the vocal leads and then rely on a lot of blunt repetition, they stop being so memorable, especially on an album that really loses all its steam on the back half. I guess my overall opinion is that it's pleasant enough, I guess. You'll probably get all those commercial soundtracks that they want, and hey, good for them, get that money. But even giving this an extremely light 6 out of 10 is not going to be enough to redeem how I'm going to forget this exists beyond fragments of the title track and everybody knows, and really then, just the hooks. Just saying. Next up, from Neon Trees, I Can Feel You Forgetting Me. And on the topic of pop rock that's flagrantly imitating the 1975 and maybe even doing it better than they did, okay look, I've always been a bigger fan of Neon Trees than many self-respecting critics would ever admit, especially coming out of the 2010s. I mean, Habits was stacked to the gills with some obvious splashy pulls from the killers, but that didn't make it any less insanely catchy, and expanding more of their sound on Picture Show made for an act that had a lot of color and promise, and then Pop Psychology wound up a pretty desaturated and mostly forgettable project, and then the band vanished from view for years as their frontman Tyler Glenn put out a solo effort in 2016, and I was just thoroughly disappointed. I wanted to see a lot more of this group. 
But now, six years later, and on their own indie label, they're looking to roar back with the sort of sly self-awareness that's always been lurking just beneath their lyrics, and it actually wound up really damn good, if a little bit derivative and swapping out its obvious influence points, as I already mentioned. But what's also worth bringing up is how it's not like the 1975 are making great dynamic pop rock right now, and Tyler Glenn, he's not the type to step out of the spotlight in the same way Matt Healy did. And I cite that as a major positive. Leaning into all the manic, horny energy exploding through every angle of this project lets Neon Trees embrace the technicolor bigness of the best 80s new wave. The stark, splashy synths, the thicker grooves, a punchy blur of gated drums and drum machines that still sound big, and enough guitar texture to not feel completely synthetic, even in some of the more faded synth wave moments on the back half of the album. Now, granted, once you get past some of the true killer hooks that are front-loaded on this project, all that flash can start to lose some of the punch, which would be where I would go to the content, and here's where I'll actually give Tyler Glenn a lot of credit. In grounding the majority of these songs in what he calls modern ghosting culture, he's not afraid to frame most of these songs as a little bit too desperate, a little too reckless in all their clingy desire for a connection or a hookup, where absolutely none of it's healthy, he knows it, but he's embracing the flailing melodrama of it all. Hell, I almost appreciate how much Tyler Glenn it will try to live within the frustration of this particular modern love with all the willful deflection of the world rather than ranting about how social media and technology is bad. And there's a wild charm to all that. Honestly, the album was so much fun and such an unexpected treat that I'm honestly a bit surprised how much I liked it. And thus... You know what? Extremely light 8 out of 10. This was the Neon Trees return. I'm so happy we finally got. It does pretty much what you want it to. You should definitely check this out. Next up from Laurie McKenna, The Balladeer. Tugging on a just tuning of strings. All the whiskey faded cigarette blown dreams. She brings herself to her own knees. With every line so delicate. At this point, I've reviewed Laurie McKenna twice already. Her sound is comfortably entrenched. Fantastic production courtesy of Dave Cobb, the sort of deceptively devastating lyrics and thematic color that placed her among my favorite writers in modern music. She's the maternal powerhouse of modern singer-songwriters across country and folk. But if I were to be critical, I did think that the tree in 2018 was a tad bit sleepy and was starting to default to the sedate mother knows best wisdom, where the charm could start to wear a bit thin, and I was curious to see if Dave Cobb would eventually encourage her to take some instrumental chances, and in a way, she actually does, because on this project, The Balladeer, the arrangements certainly feel a little bit more layered and lush, or at the very least less dry than previous albums. The one thing I notice is that the mix tends to emphasize a little more vocal depth for her, either through adding in some multi-tracking or backing vocals, or just a bit more reverb, which accentuates her performance really effectively, and the harmonies contributed from the women of Little Big Town and her fellow Love Junkies members, Liz Rose and Hillary Lindsay, it's a really nice touch, especially in accentuating the natural organic warmth here. So, okay, a richer, more well-balanced mix, better performances overall, and even a slightly more upbeat approach with the dream featuring an expansive and beautiful outro, this should be another slam dunk for her, right? Well, here's the thing. I'm not sure the songs themselves rise to the absolute best of what I know Laurie McKenna is capable, and it goes from both the lyrical construction, where there's some weird dropped rhymes and verses that feel a little bit odd coming from McKenna, to even some of the content. Now, again, some of this might be age. I've said in some of the more domestic notes of the tree, they probably resonate way more with an older audience who is closer to where she is in life. And there are absolutely cuts like when you're my age until you're grown that I could see working incredibly well for, I don't know, my mom, or hell, even for me in 30 years. But you know what, the tree still had the lot behind St. Mary's, which along with the best cuts from The Bird and the Rifle and Lorraine, they had a lot of the specific, cutting, borderline transgressive detail, but also a resonance that felt universal, not just confined to that situation. And here... <sighs> 
I don't know. I'm not sure I'm hearing that same added cutting piece in the same way. Yes, songs like This Town is a Woman and the title track have a lot of powerful detail. They're absolutely st great highlights to start the album. And when Laurie McKenna can trace through the wistful hypotheticals coached through family life on The Dream and When You're My Age or even Till You're Grown, which yes, could come across as an obvious mom advice song if some of it wasn't very cleanly rooted in some real experience. But at the same time, songs like Uphill and Good Fight, they feel a little closer to some lukewarm platitudes. And Stuck in High School feels like we were cool, but a bit more slapdash and with a weaker hook. So as a whole, you know what, don't get me wrong, this is still really great, but it feels like this album is very much in Laurie McKenna's comfort zone in terms of content. And thus, it did fall a bit short of my admittedly extremely high expectations for her. So strong 8 out of 10, absolutely worth hearing, but it's not among her best, even if I really wish it was. And finally, from Logic, no pressure. If I live, you ain't nobody. nobody. Hit the studio with no ID, make a couple platinum records in that bitch and then I dip a body. I'm normally pretty skeptical whenever an artist tries to say they're retiring. Normally it's just a factor of them taking a break, they'll be back to releasing projects sooner rather than later, it happens all the time. But listening to this Logic album, if there is someone who is retiring not just on something of a high note, but also because he might be out of things that he wants to say, and it doesn't hurt that he got handed an obscene amount of money for Twitch to chase something different, I would accept that coming out of him, it makes sense. It certainly is the feel of him being mostly out of ideas and just minding his own brief moment of legacy to crystallize something to send it all off, getting no ID back on some of the production and as an executive producer, sketching out a quasi-recursive narrative with Under Pressure, which to me remains his best album, and yet it's probably not a good sign that, once again, there's a lot of his flow and cadence here that is strikingly reminiscent of J. Cole, Kanye West, and Kendrick Lamar, and Lee leaves me thinking for a technician MC who is nevertheless so derivative, why didn't he drill into the few moments of distinctive originality that made Under Pressure's best moments for him as a rapper? I get doing an homage here, but come on, this should be about you, it's your retirement. Now granted, a lot of this came through in his concluded Young Sinatra series with a showmanship of which you can tell he's kinda tired, but when his idol Eminem brag complained about the pressures of fame and money not always making you happy, there was a wry flair or intensity to it that lodged once again tries to frame as being deeper than it actually is, nor does it allow you to overlook some of his rampant hypocrisy. No logic, you did not continuously go against the grain, especially in the past five years. That's how you got all that money in the first place that's giving you the platform to say none of it made you happy now. Or to put it another way, when the most striking commentary comes from a few Orson Welles samples, the final song here ending on an excellent full monologue from a legend, it leaves me really questioning what Logic has really contributed to this project that cuts more deeply, especially as he also tries to use this album to wrap up parts of the storyline from the incredible true story, and it somehow even has less impact than when he referenced it on multiple albums the past couple of years. And you know what, I can say all that while still acknowledging it's probably his most consistent and otherwise likable project since Young Sinatra 4, a lot of this aided by some textured, soulful samples and dusty percussion. I've said in the past, I don't want to hear logic on trap beats, and this album is proof that he's better over something that's a bit more old school and less trend chasing. Hell, I could even appreciate most of the callbacks, but by the end of the album, I was left on a note of the anti-climax. It's going out on a high note, but it could have been a higher note. So yeah, it's a strong 6 out of 10 to end things out. Logic might have moved on, but I do question how much of what he's brought to the game will really stick. Or if in 5 or so years, he'll be missed. Presuming that retirement actually happens long term. But yeah, thanks a lot for watching. If you'd like to like and subscribe, I'd be more than grateful. I can imagine I said a few controversial things here, but overall I was more positive than I expected. Beyond that, hey, if you guys want to actually get involved and help support the channel, link to my Patreon is right over here. Please don't feel any obligation to do so. I saw the economic numbers. It's tough for everybody right now. But hey, if you'd like to, opportunity is available. Beyond that, hey, if you got comments about everything else I'm doing, leave them down there below. Happy to hear from you. Till then, 
I'm Mark. You're watching On the Pulse on Spectrum Pulse. And I'll see you next time.